please open your Bibles to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1 this morning. Titus chapter 1, we'll be looking at verse 7. It will be our focus, the first half of verse 7. Uh, but uh, we'll read that, and we'll read a couple of verses here in a moment. Uh, one of the things that uh, you do when you get back from a trip, you have these pile of emails stacked up on your, on your computer. You've got to wade through and, and delete and chase away and answer and whatever it is. And uh, I had at least two from Who's Who wanting me to join Who's Who. Now, I'm not sure it was the official Who's Who in America, That's the, but, uh, you know, being I know who I am and where I'm going and, uh, and not just my mother's son, all right? And by the way, uh, the board asked me, well, can you preach today? I said, I don't know, but I know mom would want me to continue on, all right? And, uh, but I know where I'm going, and, and uh, because I know that a lot of scammers try to get you roped into something like who's who, I deleted the messages. I know I'm a true child of God because I believe the gospel that Christ died for my sins, was buried, and rose again that third day. I know I have eternal life. That's the life of God, the life, that, uh, life that's from the risen, glorified Savior. And I know I have a home eternal in the heavens. And I, I, we could quote verses with each of those, but 2 Corinthians 5, 1 tells me my home. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 gives us the gospel like we have spelled out on the, on the, uh, the, the, the wall here in, in picture form. And uh, I know that I'm, a, I'm saved by grace through faith and that not of, myself, not of myself, it's God's gift to me and it's not of my works and my doing, it's what the beautiful Savior did for me. And I pray that you too are sure of eternal life. And I, I say those things and I, I emphasize the gospel because as you hear the gospel, it gives you assurance and gives you motivation uh, to even share the gospel and be bold with it because we know who we are. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ, don't wait. Do it now, right where you sit. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, Acts 16, 31. It's that simple. And uh, I was saved at early, early in life, but I didn't, always, uh, I didn't always count myself a steward that we're going to talk about today. And, uh, in fact, we're going to talk about the idea of being faithful stewards, and God wants each of us to be a faithful steward first and foremost. Yes, if you know Jesus Christ as Savior, you're to be a faithful steward. Now, yes, in our context, it is in the, in the context of elders' qualifications. That's what we're talking about here, but... but as we look at what Paul was telling Tim, uh, Titus to do, he said, you need to appoint elders in every city. Well, there were, there were those that were qualified in every church, in every city on the island of Crete. And so he didn't have to go looking for something somewhere else. They were in those churches, and, and they, were, they were to be appointed right from the churches. And so some of the things... You know, they didn't, even though they didn't have the title at the time, they were qualified. They were the ones that were, that they were to take over and to, to minister within their own body. So far in our, in our context here, what we've seen in Titus chapter 1, as we look at the elders' qualifications, we've already seen four things in these first few verses. And so let's read the context, starting in verse 5. And then I'll point out those four things. For this reason, I left you in Crete that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. And so the primary thing, things that are lacking, things that are yet to be done within the church, number one was get these elders in place. All right. Then he goes on. If, if a man... If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, 
not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word. And I'm going to stop. In our context here, looking back at the very first part of, of chapters uh, of, of this context, the, these these uh, verses 5 and 6, and maybe, yeah, we'll see, we're getting into 7, but we, f we find four qualifications for elders so far that we've learned. They are to be believing men. We could have separated them, but it's believing men. Number two, they are to be blameless, or as we're going to see in our context again, unindictable. They are to be the husband of one wife, and when we talked about that in two messages, we said they need to have morality and a good marriage. So if they're married, they need a good marriage, but all, all these elders need to be, need to be moral, and that, that was part of the emphasis of the one wife. And then father of faithful children, if a father. They need to be, their children need to be in line, shall we say. And so then we move on into verse 7, and it says a bishop. Well, is he trying to start something new? No. The word bishop, we, we touched on it in our introduction, uh, you know, several messages ago. But the word bishop literally means someone who scopes over. Greek words are scoping over, to look over, that kind of an idea, to watch over. And uh, this is not, this is not about some position of hierarchy. This is not something about control like we find in organized re religions, often with fancy titles and clothing or whatever. This is not, uh, a bishop is not over an elder. A bishop is an elder. In other words, these are equal in, in Acts chapter 20. When we looked at that uh, several weeks ago, these elders are overseers and their role is to pastor like a shepherd would care for the sheep. That kind of an idea. That was the principle in Acts chapter 20, verses 17 to 30. And so he's just repeating the idea when he says he began with appoint elders and he said they had to have these qualifications. And now he's saying for an overseer must. And it, so if we kind of eliminate the word bishop in our mind, it's, it's the sense of being an overseer, being the sense of someone who watches over. And so someone who would watch over the flock, watch over the church. And so he must be blameless, the sense of being blameless. And uh, I give you the three Greek words that that's made up as well, not called in. Ever been called into court? Gulp. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to be called in. You want to be unindictable, unimpeachable, unreprovable. And we saw that same thing back in verse 6. And uh, one of the things we mentioned in verse 6 is that if this literally means absolutely righteous, if this literally means perfect in every way, none of us would qualify. He's talking about overall character here in the, in the context. Does this person have an overall char character of being blameless? And uh, the same, same word is used in, uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2, uh, blameless for overseers. The idea of overseers need to be blameless. And, uh, and in the context here, notice in verse 6, we tied it, if anybody was blameless as the husband of one wife, we tied it in with their family life. And now he's saying, well, this elder, this elder overseer is to be blameless or unindictable also as a steward. And he introduces the idea calling, calling, the, calling these men stewards of God. And the idea of a steward is kind of a interesting word but uh, having just flown on an airplane uh, we had stewards and stewardesses all right we that's probably a familiar idea 
What do they do uh, as a steward? Uh, well, they, they control the cabin. They take care of the needs of the passengers and, and uh, this kind of provide for safety and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but their role. In fact, when we were on our way home the, the end of May, we were in Chicago airport, way too long, but we won't go into that. Uh, but sitting in the Chicago airport there, uh, some management came from some office and they honored a stewardess that was sitting near us because it was National Flight Attendance Day or something like that, uh, May 31st. And so that was kind of neat and she got a popsicle out of the deal. Uh, uh, and, and, a, and a little thank you type idea. But it was just kind of an interesting, uh, interesting thing. And, uh, you know, on the, on the cruise ship, you have, uh, we had a steward that was in charge of our room and our meat, and then someone in charge of the meals, and then others who were overseeing, they were overseeing them, but they were all interchangeable type roles. And so J Jesus used the word steward uh, with the parable about his coming in, in uh, Luke chapter 12 and verse 42. And I, I think I have it in your notes, but, uh, but I'll read it to you. And the Lord said, who then is that faithful and wise steward? And just note the idea, the principle of a steward is that he's a servant, he's a servant and he is to be faithful. And we're going to see that God requires that all of us be faithful stewards as well. But Jesus just uses this, this as an example of his coming. And, he, and I'll continue to read here. This faithful and wise steward, whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. And so notice he's faithful and he's wise and he's a servant and he actually uses the word slave there. This steward is actually a slave. You know, the scripture oftentimes calls all of us who know Christ that we are, we are, like, we are like slaves in a sense. We are bound to our master, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there's just this principle here that he's using of being a steward and being a faithful steward that I think we can draw from. When we think about the idea of a, of a steward being a servant, we have another example in Scripture that just jumps off the page when you read Genesis 39 about Joseph. Joseph, uh, you know, here he was, his brother sold him into slavery. And yet he rose to the top and became a ruler in Potiphar's house or a steward or an overseer in Potiphar's house because, because God was with him and, and enabling him and things. But he was a slave, and that was pretty common. We need to keep that idea that a slave could actually become an overseer and a ruler and that kind of an idea. Let me read some from Genesis chapter 39, verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, uh, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made, him, made all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. So Joseph, coming from slavery, rising, rising up. This guy buys him as a slave, but he sees his qualities and, but the key thing he sees is that the Lord was with him. I think that's something to keep in mind. God wants us to be stewards in this, and people ought to see that the Lord is with us. They ought to recognize the Lord is with us. But anyway, I'm going to go on. He, so Joseph found favor and served him. Then he made him overseer over his house and all that he had put under his authority. So it was that from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And then the next verse. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hands, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. God, God worked in Joseph's life, in Joseph's situation. He was willing to be, be a servant, 
willing to, to uh, be used of God, and God brought him to the top. And, and uh, it's just fascinating. Here, this slave, we got a warped idea of slavery from American slavery. But this slave rose to the top in the Egyptian, and he was overseer over everything in the house. So the Egyptian didn't even have to worry about a thing because he was prospering. All he, all he knew is that he had good grub on uh, every day. Everything was going good for him. And uh, it was because of Joseph, but he recognized it was God with him. So overseers are stewards, are slaves. They're not lords. I think that needs to keep in mind, especially when we think about the idea of in our context here, uh, Titus was looking for, looking for elders who would be overseers, who, are, who were already stewards of God. That was one of the qualities he was looking for, that they would be, a, they would be someone who was already serving God and, and uh, doing his will. And it's interesting, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2, let a man so consider us, Paul says. So he's using his own example. He says, let someone consider uh, us as servants of Christ. You know, I just emphasize we don't, we are not lords and masters and, and that kind of thing. We might have a, a role of overseeing, but it's not that everything goes my way and you better line up or get out. You know, I think a lot of times that becomes the situation. And I've heard of pastors using that kind of, a, that kind of a angle with people. That's not how Paul's example was. The word servant here in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 1 is literally under rower. And if you think back of those old ships of the old days, they had the oars out there. Maybe you've seen Charleston Heston underneath there pulling on the oar. You know, they're down in the galley. I mean, the ship sinks, nobody bothers to, to turn them loose. You know, they're, they're the under rower. They're not up on top. They're, Paul says, let a man consider us as under rowers of Christ. Under rowers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. A faithful under rower. This idea, this idea of being an overseer, this idea of being an elder, the idea of being a steward, it is not, it is not hierarchy, it is not juggling for position or whatever, like Paul, like Joseph, faithful first to God and let your faithfulness spill out. Let your faithfulness spill out and be seen as someone who is a servant of God. Now, one of the, one of the things that 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1 says is that being an overseer is to be desired. Like you can have that desire in your heart to be an overseer, but it's not for the sake of authority. It's not for personal recognition. It's not for power. And I might be a little forceful on this because I've seen, I've seen it. I've seen the power focus in denominational connections and situations I've known of. That someone wants to be the big shot. I've seen it in, in other ministries where maybe there's a vote or something and, and someone, well, he ought to get it because he deserves it. No, nobody deserves anything. And it's not about it's not about authority. It's not about position, and uh, maybe maybe for me, having seen some of those things at a young age, even maybe it shaped my attitude. So I've never sought it out. I've never tried to seek out, uh, you know, situations of power and authority or whatever. And yet I find myself recognized as a leader. I, I, you know, I'm 
I find myself recognized as a leader in certain situations. And, and I pray that it is faithfulness that is spilled out rather than, oh, look at that Seekins guy. It's not, nothing like that. And uh, there's, there are other times I've said no to situations on boards or preaching opportunity, whatever, because you are my priority. CBC is my priority that God has given me this ministry and that's, that's where I, I have a focus. Yes, sometimes there are other situations that come up, but, uh, but anyway, I, I hope you know that. And so in our context, uh, God, I want to I wanna just remind you that God was, or Titus was to be looking for those that were already stewards of God. They were already stewards of God. They were already serving God. And then, okay, put them in this position so that they would continue and be overseers, scoping over the flock. And uh, interesting thing, in when Jesus used this word, talking about faithfulness in Luke 16, 10, he said, if you're faithful in little things, you'll be faithful in much. Be faithful where you are. Let God bring you along. Let God put you in a, in a position where he wants you to be. Let God prove you faithful and give you a greater opportunity. Now, it's interesting the word steward comes from the word house and law. That, so bear in mind with this idea, so there's a master. The master of the house says, all right, do this. Then the steward is to faithfully carry that out, that house law or the rule that the master makes. And, he, and uh, I like the way Joseph did it. He was faithful he w and he used wisdom. He was wise in this. And in the same way, we're all spiritual stewards in, in, uh, of God's stewardship. So stewards are given a responsibility, and it's called a stewardship. And in, if we look at this same word, house law, so you, got, you have house lawyers, in a sense, stewards, and then you have administration or stewardship or dispensation. And it's just, and it's, uh, it's interesting how that should flow together. So like in any house, like in any house, when, uh, when something changes, the responsibility changes. Years ago, we had carpet in the foyer. Today, we have the hardwood floor. Yeah, a vacu vacuum kind of picks it up, but you need more of a broom and a mop, right? You know, it's, it's different. The responsibility is different. And I, I apply that same kind of a thing when God changed his dealing from dealing with Jews under law to including all of us under grace. We're his stewards with different responsibilities. And the simplicity of that just ought to grip us. So to be a steward, to be a steward today you need to recognize that, that we are under grace. God's house law today is grace, not law. Man, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 2 tells us, and you might have the word stewardship, you might have the word administration, you might have the word dispensation in your translation, but we, we, are, we, have, we are under the administration or dispensation of grace. Romans uh, 6, 15, 14, and 15 both emphasize we're not under law, we're under grace. Faithful stewards will recognize that. You got to start with the right house law. And uh, yet a vast majority of Christians today, they, they cannot, they don't dare say we're not under law. I know, because I bump into Christians all the time, and, and they, they don't dare say we're not under the law. Or they might say, yeah, we're, we're under grace, but, but you know about, and they, but, 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 about the law. They have excuses. 
and situations because they don't understand, they've not been taught the emphasis on grace. So, so many believers today will, will embrace circumcision for their children because God says you've got to do it right there in the Bible. Right? I, I've, I've read that from people responding to the idea of, of, uh, of circumcision. Oh, it's in the Bible. Many people hold to the Sabbath. Of course, a lot of them that emphasize the Sabbath don't realize it was yesterday, not today. It's Saturday, not Sunday. But they'll emphasize the Sabbath because it's in the law. And then others I know have followed dietary rules. Uh, many emphasize Jewish holy days. You know, and they, they put themselves under legalism. Um, you know, and, and yet... I, I think probably most Christians today realize that, oh yeah, we don't do animal sacrifice because Christ was our sacrifice. Good. But yet, they are not crystal clear on the gospel of Christ's sacrifice. They're not crystal clear that, that Christ's sacrifice was enough. And they start adding things. In fact, uh, we'll look at it in a second here, but... We, we see several things that are, that are different throughout Scripture. Several things that are different and in different times. That in the Scripture, you can find something in Scripture that God said, do this. What did God tell Noah? Build an ark. What did God tell Abraham? Go to the land. What did God tell Moses? Let my people go. All right, that was his message and he gave them the law. What did, he, what did God direct Joshua? Go defeat the enemy in the land. Go take the land. What did God tell Jonah? Go to Nineveh. All of those are commands in the Bible. But we need to recognize the house law that we're under. And none of those apply to us. And there are, there are hundreds of things like that. We've got to recognize that... Uh, we need to recognize who we are in order to know what we're to do. Who are we today? We are the body of Christ. The body of Christ. We're not Israel. We're the body of Christ, and so we know what to do. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, just to kind of solidify this idea of stewards in our minds and the idea of having the right stewardship, I'm going to apply it with our five S's that we've been emphasizing. And... Number one, faithful stewards are true to its salvation. When I say it in your note there, its salvation, I mean the house law for today, grace. Faithful stewards are true to God's salvation. They're clear on what salvation is today, and hopefully you've already heard me emphasize with clarity the idea of, of salvation being by grace, through faith, without works. But let me give you a contrast, and I'll just take a peek back to Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Peter said, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. If you listen carefully to preachers on the radio, let's say, popular preachers, they will often bring in the idea of repent. Where are they getting that? They don't find that in our, the house law for today. Now, as believers, when we sin, we are to repent, we're to change our mind, etc. But for the salvation message, it either happens automatically that we change our mind when we trust Christ, or, or we don't even have to bother with it. And so the, but but many preachers emphasize that, and we have many. There's denominations with millions under it which emphasize the idea you got to be water baptized to be saved. That's very common. Why? Because they're under a different house law. They're not focused on the house law for today. And we'll, we'll get to the, an emphasis on that in a second here. But uh, uh, the idea, and, and oftentimes, even this Acts 2.38, because, because some of our Christian friends don't grasp the idea that that we're under the house law of grace and that Peter was preaching under the house law of law. They don't realize that, and so they start 
well, there's got to be some answer here. This is the, this is the gospel. Peter said, the, or the people asked Peter, what shall we do to be saved? And Peter said, repent and be baptized. Well, that must mean you, get, you, you believe the gospel, people, people that are even clearer, or somewhat clear on the gospel, that it's by faith, etc. Well, then you've got to get baptized later. That's not what that verse says. It, it is in conjunction with belief or repentance in the context. And we need to remember what Peter was just following, what Jesus had taught him, and Jesus was born under, a law, under the law, not under grace. Jesus lived under the law to prove that he was righteous enough to be our sinless sacrifice. For he who knew no sin became sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. And so we beg, we encourage people to trust Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone. Faithful stewards stand, stand in salvation by grace in Christ. Faithful stewards are sure of security. Holy, the Holy Spirit today is our security. The Holy, you don't have to pray for him. You don't have to ask for him. The moment you believe, you have eternal life, and he seals you with the Holy Spirit. Bam. God does that work. We need to merely trust him for that. In, uh, but in Saul's day, 1 Samuel chapter 16, Saul the Spirit of God departed from Saul. The Spirit of God was upon him, but it departed. When da so when David sins with Bathsheba, what does he do? Oh, Lord, Psalm 51, read it. Psalm 51 and verses, uh, verse, uh, I can't remember the exact verse now. Uh, he, but David just pleads for the Holy Spirit not to be taken away from him. You don't have to do that. You have the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Until the day of redemption, he's ours. That's security. Faithful stewards rest in that security and proclaim it. Faithful stewards are confident in Scripture. They're confident in, the, in Scripture because they understand that, that the, they understand that the house law of grace is found in Paul's epistles. You know, that's what uh, Schofield tried to note He's in, in the bottom of uh, Ephesians 3 in the Schofield Bible. He, he generally says, I'm not quoting him exactly, but he says, we ultimately, we only find the truth about the body of Christ in Paul's epistles. We're the body of Christ. We only find truth that is directed to us in, the body of, in, in Paul's epistles. They give us clarity of who we are, what we're to do, and where we're going. So faithful stewards are, are confident that all the scripture is for us, but only Paul's epistles are direct, directly to us and about us. And it's kind of interesting, uh, I, when we were in Alaska in our trip, uh, the, a friend of mine that shared grace with me, he, he brought it up again. He said, man, when I first begin to understand that that the, the uniqueness of Paul's ministry and Paul's epistle, he said, oh man, the whole Bible came alive for me. I realized where I should put things and how I should look at things. I didn't have to worry about trying to do something that I couldn't do because it, doesn't, it didn't apply. I don't have to worry about that. Faithful stewards are true to the scripture and rightly dividing it. Faithful stewards honor its sovereign. I like, I, I, in a sense, I wanted to start with our sovereign because that's where our focus ought to be is upon God. All through the scriptures, God is honored in, in the same way. And, and Paul's epistles honor him as well. Uh, in, I was thinking of that in one of the songs we sang as well. But in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 17, it says, He is the King eternal, immortal, invisible, only, wise God. And he deserves all the glory. And yet, 2 Corinthians 5.16 tells us that we need to, we recognize Christ differently than when he was in the flesh. And that's an interesting thought. We look at Christ differently today. We don't focus on 
him being in the flesh, we focus on our spiritual relationship with him as head of the body. Faithful stewards honor Christ as head of the body, Colossians 1.18. Faithful stewards also practice its service. We practice grace. We serve a living Savior seated at the right hand of the Father in heavenly places. We know we're complete in him. And we serve him in response to the grace that he's given us. We live for him who died for us. I was going to put that in your, in your note, Claire. Uh, congratulations, but I encourage you to live for him who died for you. But then I got on another track. But, uh, but you know, what a great encouragement. Live for him who died for you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 15. We're to be faithful ambassadors as his stewards. We ought to be begging and pleading with all to be reconciled to God with the great salvation that is ours. And we do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. Be a faithful steward and see where God takes you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the emphasis of stewards and that, that we are responsible to you first and foremost. And may you work in and through us for your glory. In Christ's name, amen.